Hello and welcome to part one of a seven part series where we're going to explore the fields in Mongo Engine. All right, let's get started with a general overview. Today we're doing, well, an overview uh, and we'll introduce one of the fields, string field, but I'll also go through a lot of the default options that you'll see on all the fields. And then after that, we're going to uh, go through the rest of the basic fields in the next episode. The episode after that, we're going to go through the basic structures that are in MongoDB, uh, including the equivalent of dictionaries or uh, mapped fields or whatever you want to call it, which we call embedded documents in uh, Mongo Engine, as well as lists. Uh, after that, we're going to go at the special look at the special case of file fields, and after that, sequence fields, uh, essentially doing global sequences in Mongo, um, and as well as the specialized territory of geospatial coordinates and that whole system in within Mongo as supported by Mongo Engine, and then finally a large variety of specialized fields that are available in Mongo Engine that again help you with uh, the overall structure for your Mongo queries. Uh, Let's do the big picture here first. Uh, just a brief version, because I'm not going to cover everything in these videos. I'm just going to get hit the highlights and make it as hopefully make it as useful as possible for you to learn about the individual fields available in Mongo Engine. Uh, first off, the the big picture of what we're working with here is we're working with BSON documents because that's what MongoDB is based on. Um, now, BSON is a compressed extended version of JSON, which if you've done any uh, like RESTful queries or any kind of uh, uh, JavaScript programming, you're probably very familiar with already. Um, and on top of that, of course, is MongoDB database. And on top of that is a library called PyMongo. Mongo Engine depends on PyMongo because PyMongo is the actual, it's a thin, thin library that wraps the uh, code necessary to reach MongoDB. In fact, you could do pretty much everything we're going to talk about in Mongo Engine with PyMongo directly, but it won't have the benefit of Mongo Engine's overhead. And of course, we're going to go over Mongo Engine itself. Uh, this, these videos are targeted at version 0.11.0, but hopefully it'll work for later versions as well. Um, the role of Mongo Engine is to create a structure that's normally not present in MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB's benefits, uh, one of the big benefits of uh, a NoSQL database is its ability to scale and to be very efficient at uh, systems where there's more reads than there are writes. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to a NoSQL database like MongoDB, um, including its flexibility, but that benefit is also a drawback. And one of the purposes of Mongo Engine is to create some structure to the data that doesn't exist naturally. Um, so it does error checking and field validation and uh, structure validation on the uh, data back and forth. So let's go ahead and jump in a little bit. Uh, first off, some quick terminology things. I think a lot of you know this already. In MongoDB, an object is how they say dictionary, and a field is how they say key. So a dictionary contains elements that have a key pointing to a value. Whereas in MongoDB, you have objects where you have fields pointing to values. Let's go ahead and jump in and do some programming. Um, to get started, of course, you have to import Mongo. And let's go ahead and make a document. Uh, let's call it famous quote. We're gonna have a collection of famous quotes. Um, and this, of course, that class is wrapping around a document. And we'll make one string field within that document. And we'll see what that looks like when we're finished here. Uh, we need to connect to a database. Uh, let's go and make that document famous quote. a variable. My quote. That's a famous quote. Uh, my quote dot text. So we'll go and assign a assign that string that we created in our class. Uh, I think that's a Stephen Hawking quote there. 
And let's go ahead and save it. And like I said, I'm skipping past a lot of stuff. I'm not trying to teach you how to use Mongo Engine as a whole. We're going to concentrate on the fields and their characteristics. So we're going to be concentrating on that line up there in the class up here that says text equals string field. Uh, we're going to save it. And let's take a look at what it looks like. My quote dot to JSON. Um, let's make it pretty. And let's see if this runs. Ah, oh, there's a syntax error, of course. Yep, missing a colon. Let's try it again. No module name Mongo engine. Oh, good grief. I'll be right back. So uh, it's installed now. Let's try running it. And there we go. Um, let's take a look at this Mongo engine document I just printed out. This, of course, is a JSON document, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you have a dictionary that wraps the whole thing, or an object in the MongoDB terms. Um, the base of any Mongo engine document, or any MongoDB document, is a dictionary. Um, it's never going to be a list. Um, so we have our dictionary, and within that dictionary we have our first key, uh, which is, of course, the ID for this, and that's assigned automatically by MongoDB. You know, as I never I never did this, never put this number in. That's automatic. Um, now, it's an object ID field, and in BSON, there is in fact a field type called object ID, but in JSON, there isn't. So when I printed this out as a JSON document, it had to do something with that. <laughs> and this is what it does. This is the appearance as it's seen in JSON. But in fact, if this were a BSON document, which is its true form in MongoDB, there wouldn't be this extra wrapping around here. It'd actually be ID underscore ID equals object ID, and then this name right here, that number, excuse me. Uh, this is a 12-byte um, hexadecimal string. Uh, now let's take a look at our actual string field here. Text is the name of the field, and then of course my quote. That I typed in. So if I'm here, I can in fact let's go and take a look at it. So I what did I call that? My quote. Yeah, my underscore quote. So let's observe things here. My under, underscore quote. Of course, it's the famous quote object. My underscore quote dot text. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and print representation of that so I'm going to show you something here right off the bat to take to uh, pay attention to in string fields um, if I do this um, you'll see a uh, typical string and but uh, watch what happens if I reload this document my quote dot reload reload is a method that causes it to pull it pull the exact uh, document back from the database so we can see what it looks like from there. Reload. I'll do the same thing again. Print quote.text. Notice there's a U in the front of this string. That's because a string field in MongoDB is always a Unicode UTF-8 string. Uh, doc, everything's in Unicode. And of course, I'm running 2.7 here, uh, which by default goes to a C style string, I believe. Uh, but it certainly doesn't default to a Unicode string. Now, Python's pretty good about converting back and forth. So most of the time, you don't have to pay attention to that. But do keep that in mind. All strings in uh, are, in fact, Unicode strings. Um, and so let's play around with this a little bit more. OK, so here's our class for famous quote. Uh, we have a text string, and of course I can put another text string if I wanted to, author name. But let's start playing around with some of the settings. Uh, one of them is, what if I want this name, this uh, property name of the class, uh, to be different than the actual the field name of the field in the database? Uh, that is possible to do, and that's you do that with the DB field uh, parameter. So XYZ. 
So I'll save author name as like this. My quote dot name equals X. Um, I think it was Stephen Hawking, wouldn't it? May or may not have the spelling of that right, but there it is. So let's run this again. It'll make a brand new document in the collection. And there it is, Stephen Hawking. But look at the name of the field. It's XYZ. So even though I can still go back in here, my quote dot author name. Uh, but what won't work is this because there is no such attribute. Uh, and we can do this. That worked too. Although do use some caution. It's, it's a class, not a dictionary. So there's some things that are dictionary-like about a document and there are some things that are not. So use that with some amount of caution, but that very simple use absolutely works. I can get a pull it like it was a dictionary. Let's go ahead and go back into uh, our document here. Let's look at another field here. Um, let's say I don't say a field, uh, I don't provide a author name. Well, I can default or provide a default. So author unknown and let's put that out. So now this next document I'm going to run, I'm going to get, uh, I'm not going to assign an author name and it defined it for me. Um, if I don't have a default, it'll literally just skip the field. It'll, it won't put an XYZ field in there at all. Let's look at another parameter. Let's look at uh, required. Now the required field has two purposes. Um, in fact, let's do this. Let's not create a default. Let's uh, take the default out for the moment. And again, I'm not going to define a uh, author name. And let's see what happens. I got an error, a validation error. Uh, by setting a field to required, it that field must have must be filled out in some way or shape or form. Now I can fill it out with an empty field. I can put in uh, just empty quotes. That's not a problem. I can't fill it out with a none though. It won't accept none. It'll only accept, it only accept a string and you must define a string or you will get an error. Uh, so that is a way to make sure that no matter what you're doing, you do fill out that field or your program will not continue. Um, now if I say it required and I provided a default, then of course, it'll work because I didn't have to give it a field name. I give the field a value, it'll just work. And again, it gave the default by default. All right, and let's take a look at another parameter. Uh, string field does support the choices parameter. Uh, let's try that out. So choices, um, let's say, let's pretend that you can only have, I'm gonna take a lot of this out. Let's pretend we can only have uh, three possible authors because who would ever want to quote anyone else other than these three? So uh, I can create a list of the authors that I'm willing to accept. So authors equals uh, who else I am so not spelling that right I'll just say Albert <laughs> and uh, uh, Dan TDM All right. So now this will work.
There we go. It accepts Stephen Hawking. But if I just call it Stephen, and that will fail. No, it took it. It took it. Let me check on some. I'm back. Um, simple spelling error. It's uh, choices, not choice, as the parameter name. Uh, so choice is equal to authors. Now it should run. Save. Run. There it is. Validation error. And so this enforces uh, that you have one of a limited selection. Now you can do this as uh, this is a list. You can do it as a uh, tuple. You can also do it as a tuple of tuples. And actually, let's do this. You might be able to do it. I think it's any iterable. Let's see if it'll do it as a dictionary. I'm about to learn something. <laughs> so not just any iterable, um, although perhaps oh, yeah, that works. Of course, that just by doing dot keys method on. Uh, authors I'm essentially creating a list out of my dictionary so interesting anyway uh, parameters we can do that are limited to strings you can have max length which is exactly what it sounds like you can set the maximum length for something you know min length you know has to be at least two characters long um, and of course you can have uh, a regex uh, which is probably outside the scope of this document, but you can create a, a regex value that it actually searches against to make sure that the general format of your field is correct. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate them. Those are fairly self-evident. You can also go always go to the documentation and take a look at them. Uh, so we have the string field described. We have uh, put it in the context of a document. And I think next we're going to start doing the rest of the basic fields. Um, and the, the odd quirks and things you need to look for for those. Um, you have, for example, what's the difference between a float field and a decimal field and that type of thing. We're going to go into some detail with that. Uh, but this is a good first start, and I hope to see you at the next video. Please subscribe if you like what you see. Thanks. Bye.